Hey everybody, welcome back for season two of the Broken Banquet Podcast. This season, we've got more interviews with missionaries around the world, more interviews with authors who have written amazing books about missions, and more conversations about what it means for us to abide with one another. And yes, probably a story or two about Ashley taking a walk, eating food, or having drinks with someone who she now loves. We're so glad you're back. We're glad to be back. And we hope that you will enjoy this episode. (laughs) You got me on Monday morning and I apologize. This might be the most relaxed episode of the Broken Banquet ever. And Ashley, so much so that I'm giving you permission to just hold your microphone in your lap. Really? Just because I'm already holding mine in my lap. I feel like you're going to instantly regret that. Well, you know, at this point, it's just part of the course. (laughs) Regretting things? When it comes to me, Hamish, you have no idea. (laughs) That's my goal now, is just to be consistent. Is that why when everyone's like, oh, we love Ashley, he just remains silent? Yes. (laughs) Yesterday, true story, he comes up to me. And he's because you're sitting on one side of the room. I'm sitting on the other side of the room. He's like, "Did you and Will like have a row?" Or yeah, like, like, you guys fighting? Did you did you guess something happened? <laughs> so I was standing in the back because I liked being in the back, seeing the whole church kind of come together. And then I noticed that John Woodward was sitting by himself on the left side. So I don't know if he and Ashley got in a fight, but I went to sit with John Woodward because Ashley was sitting with Chris. So John was all by himself. So that's why I sat on the other side. Hey, Ashley, I have a fun fact for you about New Zealand. Tell Maybe me. this will be interesting for the two of us and all the non-New Zealanders who listen to this podcast. So I got a, into a sort of chicken and egg conversation with myself last night in the kitchen. You know, which came first, the kiwi fruit or the kiwi bird? Right. I, I so remember I you asking. At I'm good. four o'clock this morning. As you I was do. awake already. Before I started re-listening to the Hamish and Nate podcast, just so that I be somewhat informed about I did that too on the airplane on the way over yeah yeah that's me doing research okay good because did you find that in the Bible it's in Genesis huh when God created things there was an order see was it animals first this is why I don't talk to people it was fruit fruit came before animals oh so then it was kiwi fruit this is why I don't talk to people (laughs) (laughs) but it wasn't always known as the kiwi fruit the kiwi fruit was called something entirely different. Yes, if you would please look up what a kiwi fruit was called. Chinese before. gooseberry. That's it. Chinese gooseberry. And the Chinese gooseberry producers decided that it looked shockingly similar to the kiwi bird and decided that they would convince the world to stop calling them Chinese gooseberries and call them kiwis, and it worked. Actually, slight amendment to that. Stop. It was a good story. <laughs> it's a great story. Just because you're the New Zealander no, doesn't I, mean you get I, to I, that's my story about New Zealand. I, I want to just add a complaint to this because the producers <laughs> of the kiwi fruit convinced the world to uh, change the name to kiwi fruit because we wanted to distinguish between the kiwi bird and the kiwi fruit. So it's kiwi fruit. But the Americans decided that is far too long a word to actually say. Sure. And so they called it kiwi. And they don't have the birds, so why would they? And were the people here already known as Kiwis because of the bird, or did that happen? That happened in World War One, because we had a because the Kiwi is a national symbol, so we had that on our uniforms. And so it's an intimidating-looking bird, by the way. Yeah, very intimidating. Have you seen the beak on that thing? I wouldn't want to get punctured with that. So um, we had them on on our uniforms, and people started calling us Kiwis, and we like, yeah. That's fine. Friends, on the Broken Banquet podcast, you not only learn about Jesus, relationships, but then you also get a history lesson about kiwi fruit and kiwi birds. I just thought that since we're on location for the first time ever right. in New Zealand, yes. we should, we should Welcome. offer some... Howdy my, everybody. Welcome. What? Howdy my, welcome. Oh, thank you. Kia ora. Kia ora. So yeah, I called something a haka earlier, and it definitely wasn't a haka. What were we, what were we saying, Wolf? So, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what they're saying. Something. First time in New Zealand. Welcome. Hey, yes, welcome. Here we are. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. That's all I got. Welcome. I, I thought welcome. you were going somewhere else with that, but okay. no. I just thought it. I thought we would honor the fact that I'm not in my office in Costa Rica. Ashley's not in her office in Shreveport. We are in 
New Zealand and praise God. A little New Zealand trivia. And we brought out the best weather for you guys. Yeah, you're welcome. There is a subtropical X cyclone in Auckland at the moment. The weather is so great. They've given it a name. Lola. 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 So, folks listening on the podcast, what we're doing right here is called Fenomitanga. Yes. Um, and it's a Maori phrase where you actually get together. And first, you just catch up as friends and you do a lot of stuff like this before you get down to business. Mm-hmm. Which to me sounds like abiding which sounds like mm. we're exactly doing what we're supposed to be doing. There's an incredible amount of tikanga or, or Māori values that emulate what Jesus wants us to do as Christians. And they've been doing it long before any white man ever showed up and <gasps> told them about Jesus. It's very cool. That's scandalous. It is scandalous, but it just shows the heart of God on his people, even if they weren't looking to him. So shockingly, in our last conversation that we had, we actually talked about the fact that God is already at work in places that we haven't gotten to yet, Mm -hmm. thinking that we're taking him into those places. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can I introduce the listeners to all of these voices? I think we just shouldn't. This should be the first episode where we never introduce people. It's probably safer. uh, I mean, their voices, (laughs) if, if anyone's been listening to the podcast for any amount of time, they probably can guess who's on the podcast Could today. Mm-hmm. This is Ashley, and this is Will. Hey, Will. Will Dunn. Hey, Ashley. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm good. We're in New Zealand. We are in New Zealand. Any day in New Zealand is a better day than sitting in my office. Even with the tropical cyclone. Even with the tropical it. cyclone. Because we did learn that uh, the original name for New Zealand means long white cloud. That's Aotearoa. true. And there's a lot of that out there, Land of the Land of the Long White Cloud. Oh, yeah. Do you know why it's called Land of the Long White Cloud? Uh, yeah, I can look outside and tell. Yes, there's a lot of gray clouds. It is sort of a, a damning praise about New Zealand weather, but it was when the first, um, I think, Coupe, if I'm, if I'm doing this right, he was one of the first explorers to find New Zealand, and he saw the cloud above the land before he saw the land because of the horizon, and that's how he knew there was land there because he saw the long white cloud. And he knew it was a lot of land because it was a long white cloud. Hence the name Aotearoa. See, all sorts of trivia to that. Yeah, that was free, fantastic. by the way. You did not have to yeah. pay for that. Ashley, you want to introduce our guests on the podcast? To my left is the one and only Hamish Taylor. Hey. I loved your interview because we were in the same room together. Mm-hmm. And, and Will was, of course, in Costa Rica. Yeah. And the one and only Nate Hutchison. Episode two. Two. First full episode with an interview. Yes. Tell us, Nate. Uh, tell us about who you are. Oh, so about who I am. Okay, so I, I'm, a, I'm an American-born person, but I'm now a citizen of New Zealand and Ooh. America. Uh, we moved over, my wife and I, Whitney, moved over in 2007. So if you listen to the second podcast, you might uh, hear about that or have heard about that. And so we moved over with Hamish Shamali and another couple we started a church in Christchurch, New Zealand. We all had babies. Uh, we, we went through earthquakes. Mm-hmm. And, you know, long story short, we ended up in 2015 moving up to Auckland where Hamish and Molly were also here. This is your hometown. And we begged them to plant a church with us. And they said no. Okay. That's right. Twice. Two okay. times. Yeah. And it's, third so, time was the charm, though. So we said, we will wait. We didn't ask it third no, time. No, that's true, yeah. Because the Lord then called them back into church planting, and it was a three-year wait in Auckland while we served at Shore Community Church, and finally got to plant our second church, and it's now Quick Quick story years. about that. Yeah. The time in between, because I, I had burnt out, so I was like, I don't know if I can do this again. And then that morphed from when when Nate and Wendy came up and they started doing um, worship leading at Shore Community Church where we were going. And I realized uh, I would never do a church plant again unless it's with him because he has this way of worship leading that it's just different from anyone else I've seen um, where he just, he's good, like it's quality, but it's more than that. It's bringing, like he just brings me into the space of worship unlike other people. If I could be led by any worship leader in the world, it would be, first of all, David Crowder, 
second of all, Nate Hutchison. Oh, wow. Definitely. So that's wow. just to be honest. That's high that. praise. Um, but anyway, so that morphed into, um, you know, we, I, I would only ever plant with him again. And that morphed into, why am I not planting with him? <laughs> like, this just makes so much sense. So I think it's preached a sermon. And then uh, you, you did it too. Dumb. So, that was a dumb idea. Uh, something about like walking on the wall, like getting out of the boat. Getting out of the boat or, or just following what you know is to be the right thing to do and just getting out there and doing it. And I knew as soon as the words were coming out of my mouth, I was like, stop. Yeah, <laughs> stop you, saying you that. You convinced yourself. You got to be careful what you preach about. <laughs> yeah, sure. um, so I I was thinking about, was I was listening to the, the previous episodes with you guys and sort of your two stories and how they've intersected and then and you know, sort of on multiple occasions. And, and Hamish, you shared the first time that you were actively praying to not go back into a church while Nate was actively praying that you would go back into a church and that Nate won. He's a better Clearly, prayer Clearly, he's I much am. more connected yeah. to, mm-hmm. to the big guy. Mm-hmm. I'll argue with that. <laughs> I neither would I. <laughs> but also, I think it's interesting that, and, and Ashley, correct me if I'm wrong, but was it you came here to Hobsonville? That's where we have yes. right? Hobsonville. Yes, yes. With Nate yes. years ago, yes, and at that time there was basically nothing here but an old Air Force base, and prayed about this community. We bumped into Gordon, a church member, yesterday, who I guess lives like on the other side of this. Is this an estuary or a river or something over here that I'm pointing to that nobody can see but the four of us? Has a wall, and, and there's a wall, but on the other side of the wall, <laughs> oh, yeah. a road, and then there's a neighborhood, and then there's a body of water. And I think what I understood from Gordon yesterday was that he and and his wife lived on the other side of that body of water, and they would also look over at this place and pray about a church being planted here at this place. And so then fast forward to yesterday, and we're in this community in a wonderful building with almost 200 people worshiping at Church Northwest. It's absolutely incredible. That's all. Only God could do that is what what I have to say about that. I think that when I look back at how the pieces of the puzzle fell into place, um, we couldn't have orchestrated it. And I think a, a lot of people have the same experiences where you look back on your life and you're like, how in the world did this happen? Mm-hmm. Like, if we don't immediately say, I didn't do that, God did, and give him the praise and the glory for that, I feel like we're already on the wrong track and we're, that can lead to pride and uh, all sorts of ugly things. So I I always, always want to point back to God did this. Mm. Even just meeting you, mm-hmm. um, Ashley, was instrumental. I didn't know you, and I had no, there was really no way we would have had a connection mm-hmm. other than God and timing. And, and John Woodward. John Woodward, yeah, well, which is, he's very close to Jesus. So another little um, <laughs> twist on the the Hobsonville story is that when we first in two thousand whatever year you said you came out to New Zealand seven yeah yeah when we came out in two thousand seven we were looking for a place to plant and Nate and Whitney were very strong on the West Auckland area mm-hmm. and there was a lot of projected growth and that sort of thing um, and then but we we sort of veered away and I think God sort of guided us away from that because it wasn't ready. But he was already planting the seeds. Like, this is a place that sits deeply, um, especially with Nate and Whitney. And, and we sort of followed their lead into this space of, like, this is this is a fertile ground. It just wasn't fertile enough back in that first time around. It wasn't the right time no. in 2007. Yeah. But growth, definitely, yeah. Growth-wise in exactly. this area. But we knew it was coming. Yeah. Yeah. So he, he's like, it was very much a not yet but it was still part of the plan. So it's part of our DNA, even back from the beginning when we planted in Christchurch. This area had been a big part of that conversation. Mm-hmm. There's several things about this the story of, of sort of what's gotten both of you to where we are now that I think is really interesting and really different from um, a lot of other stories of churches getting started. And I think one is just the, the relationship between the two of you and how you work together. Can you talk a little bit about just sort of leadership-wise, kind of who does what, uh, how how it's, like it's not a typical senior pastor, associate pastor, church staff sort of relationship, right? How how you guys 
we did that in the first church plant in Christchurch. We had a very traditional sort of, I was the head guy um, and, um, you know, Nate and this other guy, they were below and we had a few people sort of involved in that space. And the burden of that was part of the reason I, I burnt out. I just, I was first time, it was a first time ministry right out of Bible college. Um, and I didn't know, they had to teach me how to lead in a lot of ways, which I was very thankful for. Um, and just the, the burden of everything being on my shoulders, um, it just, just put me off the cliff there a little bit, which I think that was part of what God was showing me. Um, he did so in such a way that it didn't, you know, destroy the church right away. It was just, it was a good process, but um, it showed me that I need a lot more support. I need a lot more support around me. So Nate came up with a really great plan this time around to make sure that we um, yeah, didn't go down that same road. Yeah, and we can talk about that. But what, one thing I want to say is that when Hamish was leading in Christchurch, one thing I loved about how he did that, it, it was a very Kiwi model, of, I, I feel like, of leadership where uh, instead of being the top dog that makes all the sh- calls the shots, right? Um, you would you would often like if we were in a meeting, you'd listen to everyone's uh, thoughts on an idea, and then you'd like kind of consider all the options. And sometimes you'd add your opinion as well, but often he would just kind of like say, "Well, this is what I'm hearing from the group, and this is probably where I'm feeling like we should lead." What do you guys think? And so. That that was a good example, I think, of how he naturally would lead. But the the unfortunate side of church leadership is that like the way people have led in the past, the way that the traditional model of churches go, um, often puts people just like start to put a lot of pressure on the the lead guy, whatever you call that, senior minister, lead pastor, whatever. And so I think that got to Hamish. I think he was overwhelmed by that mm-hmm. thought. And I grew up as a church uh, uh, pastor's kid, and and my wife Whitney did as well. And and our dads were the very traditional, you know, the the leader, the guy who had to be there at every wedding, every funeral. Um, and and it was just like a lot of stress. Nearly like killed my dad. <laughs> okay, literally. And so I don't think that's a great model. I I love the way my dad led. And I think that he did a great job. He was a wise, loving, caring pastor, but I don't think it's a good model for his health, for anyone's well-being who's in that position to be top dog calling all the shots. I don't think there's a biblical example for it. I don't think it's sinful necessarily or wrong. It's just, I feel like there's a better way. And the New Testament church shows us that the elders led the church. Mm-hmm. They even shared in preaching, teaching, prayer, uh, pastoral stuff. And so we want to get back to more of that kind of model. So instead of one person at the top, I, I was thinking, hey, why don't we take some of the burden off of Hamish and I'll share some of this and I can do pastoral care and you don't have to feel like that's all on your shoulders, right? And or I can handle some of the admin stuff, um, some of the executive stuff that needs to happen so that you can focus more on what you're good at, what you're passionate about, which is teaching. Um, and, and lately I've even been helping with that, you know? So I feel like that's a much better, better model. And also we, our whole staff mm-hmm. operates this way. So Molly and Jody. Um, also are kind of like first among equals is what we call it. So in their, in their areas, it's not like Hamish and I are kind of over them. Like we just, we listen to what, what they want to do. We give them feedback, we help them out, but they are very much, um, autonomous in their area of the church as well. The, the dignity in that. Just provide a little clarity around that too. Nate and I are part of the eldership. So the elders hold sort of an equal leadership share, um, which is what we see biblically. Practically, Nate and I being full-time staff do a lot of the the legwork and stuff like that. So um, for the other part-time staff that we have, there is still a sense of hierarchy in the sense that Nate and I are elders. 
So with our elder hat on, we sort of are part of the the leadership of the church in, in a way that they're, they're not as much, yeah. um, which I think provides something of a, of a safety net for them as well, mm-hmm. that they are autonomous. They do, they can run their ministries the way that they want to run them, but they also have a level of accountability to the eldership. So it's not just to the senior pastor, but it's the senior pastors, Nate and I, as part of the eldership group. So it's, it's a, it's, we're sort of figuring it out as we go along too, in a lot of ways, because it's not a model you see a lot. And I think it works because of who you are and uh, who you are. And I mean, <laughs> all I've heard is this encouraging, uh, apparently of it each is other. the perfect church model. My oh, goodness. just coming to a staff meeting sometime. Yeah. It's not always this way. Um, <laughs> no, we, we we're, we're good, agree a lot. And I think that's because we're very different. Yeah. Did you say yin and yang? So like we, we have different strengths, yeah. we have different perspectives and that's good. Like mm. it's be- we're better because of it. Um, but we've learned to meld that together, right. And, and work together with our strengths and differences yeah. to make it better rather than butt heads. Yeah. I agree. And then, you know, we'll have times of conflict and stuff like that, just like anybody else. But yeah, there's a trust there and that trust has been built up over years of working together and knowing each other, our kids have grown up together. There's a closeness and a bond there between our families, um, which helps because it you do have to trust the other person in order to give up leadership and authority to them. So I, I as a as a leader for myself, I struggle. I'm still learning and understanding how to be a leader in a model like this, as I was learning in the model in Christchurch. And so, if I didn't trust Nate, I don't think I could do this model. I couldn't do it with anybody. You know, well, you wouldn't even want to work with someone you didn't trust. Well, no, but I mean, there's, there's a, I can work with some people, but then there's people I really trust. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so from my perspective as, as a leader, it means I maintain what I believe God has given me to do of preaching a teaching of vision casting, that sort of thing, which is the traditional top of the pyramid type thing, but I don't have to bear the weight of all of the other things that need to happen. And so I could delegate, which is what a lot of pastors do, but I still bear the responsibility for it, especially pastoral care. That's one that is really hard for pastors to get rid of. And I'm not good at it. I'm just not good at it. I can sit down with someone in front of me and I, and they can pour their heart out and we will engage. And so I can do that. But if I'm not in front of someone, my brain doesn't necessarily go, oh, I should talk to this person or I wonder how they're doing or, you know, let's see, what, how can we help everybody? No, I'm like, I've got to do what's in front of me. So Nate is much better at this. So to be able to give that over and not just to give the work of it, but to give the responsibility over to it, mm-hmm. to where if now he's accountable mm-hmm. for the pastoral ministry of our church, that's, it's a beautiful burden to get rid of. And and the, the beautiful thing is what I've done is I've, I've transferred that burden onto the whole church, <laughs> which is a beautiful model as well, yeah, but you're still over it. You still hold to make sure that it happens. Yes. And, and yeah, you're better at it than you think. Um, and, and if I'm, if I'm good These at guys. remembering <laughs> people, it's not really me remembering. It's usually Whitney reminding me to, I should look hey, at team effort, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, no. We, our model for pastoral care is to like to we our our vision for the whole church is we help each other take next steps toward Jesus. And we should write that down. That's a good statement. <laughs> I think I I'm so glad. I that think our people are are starting to get it. Yeah, I I'm starting to hear people say that back to me and say, "Hey, you guys That's actually good. really get your vision. Like you do your vision." And other people are starting to to do that vision in their own context within our yeah church. very yeah. I'm just starting to get really self-conscious that if this is what partnership and ministry is supposed to look like. Yeah, well, actually, we got a long way to go. We got a long way. Well, being in the same country sure helps. <laughs> <laughs> Seeing each other on a daily basis. Well, we started the first church plant. We had this, you know, the the people who pray together stay together. We sort of we don't pray to get on. We do, but like we said, people who play together stay together. That was something that we started for them. We don't do it as well lately because, you know, life gets in the way and, and kids and stuff. 
But we established that early on. And when we first started, where we every Sunday night, we get together, we just play games. Yeah. And it was so affirming to build that relationship that we're bearing the fruit of that, even though we're not doing it as much. Like we don't get together as often. We had lunch together the other day. It was really nice. But we don't do that as much because life. But it's like an investment. You know, we invested that early on in the piece. We invested in each other. And now the dividends are still coming, even though we're not necessarily as putting in as much. We're still getting out of it and this trust and this sense of camaraderie and closeness that I think we put in. We're really more praying together now. We do pray together. but And, and I, often I'll say, um, Hamish, do you want to go see this movie? And he'll be like, oh, I told Molly I'd go see that movie with her. So I'm like, I guess I'm just going to go this see is, it. This is our therapy it. session now, is it? <laughs> <laughs> so we've gotten into counseling now? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that reminds me, though, that the relationships that Yolanda and I have with some of the churches that have been working with us from the very beginning. So for 20 years, they were some of the first teams that came down. And during those first years, we had, we had very little infrastructure yet as far as taking, you know, taking care of the teams and housing the teams and all that sort of stuff. So we would, whatever community we were working in for a season, we would go and we were sleeping in Sunday school classrooms or in school mm. classrooms, or there was a couple of places where we just took tents and would sleep in tents. But because like that was such an, inv- I see that now as such an investment in the relationship with those churches, because it forced us to spend all of our time together. Yeah. Now, you know, when the work day ends, if that ever actually happens, but you know, in the evenings we go home and we do homework with Isabella and we have dinner together and the teams are at the missions and ministry center doing their team stuff in the evenings. It's a more comfortable way to be able to tend to the teams, to have facilities for them to stay in and that sort of thing. And it's nice that we get to sleep in our own bed at night instead of on an air mattress in a Sunday school classroom. But we've sacrificed a lot of that bonding time and so we still we love the churches that are coming to work with us now but those relationships are just always going to be different doesn't mean they're going to be better or worse but they're going to be different because we're not sort of going through this it's sort of hardship i mean i hate to say it that way because it wasn't a hardship but it was it's challenging to you know have 20 people sleeping in a sanctuary yeah yeah and you know gosh there was a community we worked in early on that had no electricity so we would take these giant blocks of ice in a plastic bag with sawdust around it in another bag. And that's how we kept everything cold, like meat and fruits and vegetables cold for the week. And, and for gosh, for Yolanda and and the ladies in the community to be dealing with feeding these groups of people in those circumstances, you know, the bond that Yolanda has with the women in these communities is completely different from now where, you know, we just, we call up somebody at the market, they drop off the food we need for the week and we're ready to roll. So I can see how something like game night once a week with your families, it just creates a different kind of, of relationship. But isn't that the whole point of intentionality? Like we have to just be intentional about how we are in relationship with one another. And because there aren't those types of things where we're together 24 seven, that we have to either be intentional about how we do interact or that when we're together, we really make the most of every Mm -hmm. moment we're together. And because I feel like that when I'm with you all is, you know, I, I drop in for a week, sometimes, you know, more than a week, but I try to make the most of the time that we have together, whether it's sitting around just joshing and joking and having a good time. What was the word? Da-da-da, time. Thank you. And but making sure that we just have intentional conversation, sitting in the car with Nate. How is it with your soul, Nate? Let's talk about things, you know, and, and you know, well, that's, that's down the to benefit the... of Fernando Sanga, isn't it? That's, right. that's what Maori people knew and understood was that the sharing, the abiding, the the being together first as because it's a priority thing. If we run out of time for something, it's going to be the business, not the connectedness. Yeah. You know, and and we still staff meetings are still like that, you know? Mm. And we <laughs> spend a good amount of time just sitting around chatting and like, oh, we should probably do something, you know. Yeah. And that's that's good because it sets a tone, it sets a culture for the team and, and what it means to work together. I, yeah. I, I see the fruit of that. It's got to be 
it's going to be fun too. Like you can't just be all about business. Yeah. Because it will eat you up. It'll eat you up. Spit you out. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Ministry's hard. Ministry's as, hard. As we know. It's so hard. Yeah. It, it was hard for people to understand what we were coming here for on this trip. Yes. Like they would like, what do you, what is it you're going to be doing in New Zealand? Is it work? Like, well, well I didn't know what you were coming to do. I was like, what are you guys coming but, for? But it's hanging out. Okay. Yeah. This out. right That's now, cool. like the day we got here and, and we're all, all four of us were gross and needed somewhere to get cleaned up. And after you asked permission, invited us to your house to get cleaned up. And we just spent, you know, several hours at your house eating croissants and, you know, rehydrating. And it was fantastic. It was the best part of this trip. Supposed to be for Sunday morning. We we didn't dip into one of those. Oh, Sorry about that. Oh, truth comes. We out. went back to the grocery store. <laughs> <laughs> we had we had one. So, it's like is that like eating the sacred bread? You know, uh, from the temple because there was nothing else. Jesus said it's yes, okay. yeah. that that was it exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I interrupted. Yeah, you've completely derailed my really deep story <laughs> that I was trying to tell about you know saying to people we're just going to go spend time with these friends of ours and hopefully encourage them and be encouraged and like we're just going to hang out with people that ashley loves that we love well <laughs> that's, that's, <laughs> ashley loves, yeah. that's fair that's honest i appreciate that no i mean it we do yeah. we do so but but the thing is you're intentional about it it's hard to get across the world like you've got to put the time and effort mm-hmm. and money into it um and it's like anything that's worth fighting for. You gotta fight for it. Like, like if you want to, if you want to have a healthy lifestyle, it's hard to to cut out the time of, in your life to exercise, for example. Um, and I heard someone talking about this in the in the context of relationships. If you, they said, if you want to have uh, a community of people around you, if you, and I think they were talking about it actually in in the context of like a small group, a home group kind of thing. Uh, you are going to have to be the one to put yourself out there. And it's going to feel like mm-hmm. you're doing all the work. And people are going to back out last minute. And some nights they're not going to show up at all. Preach it. But you've got to be intentional and just keep trying. And eventually it's going to happen. You're going to have a community. But somebody's got to be the one to step up and do that. And, and in our case... Uh, for so many people around the world, Ashley's been doing that. Like you're doing the 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 legwork of organizing and do it. And I know it's not easy. I see it, <laughs> but you you do it, and it's it pays off because family, people, we got we done. It's like this. It reminds me of, uh, we had a, a youth that came down last summer with a group and <clears throat> towards the end of the week, it was like Thursday night. So then last night, everybody's together. We have some worship time and communion together and people they want to will share about what, what the week's meant to them. And he, he started off by talking, I've told this story on here before, but how he didn't speak a whole lot of Spanish. He spoke a little bit, but not a whole lot. And so he was sort of dealing with how how exhausting it was to try and communicate with the Costa Ricans that, that he'd spent the week with. And, and he said, I, you know, I had to pay so close attention to every word that I wanted to say and be really intentional about picking those words. And then I had to be just as intentional about listening to what they were saying to me so that I could try and understand what they were saying. He said, it was exhausting. It's so easy to talk to people when we're at home because we you don't have to put any thought into it. Mm. I just thought, holy cow, like that's that should be the goal. That kind of intentionality should be the goal for every conversation we have with anyone who's in front of us, but also for these relationships, like that kind of intentionality, putting that much effort into the things that we're saying to people and also listening and understanding the things that they're saying to us I mean, he's right. It's so easy to not try and to just kind of go through it. And, you know, there's people around and you kind of know them, but you don't really get to know them. And you're kind of in church, but you're not really in the community. And, and all that stuff takes effort. And, and Nate, you're right. You know, I think we, our families see the effort 
that Ashley and First Church put into building these relationships and helping us maintain these relationships. And so back to church planting. Oh, yeah. Is that what we're talking I'm, about? <laughs> so I'm interested because I grew up in, you know, the in the the south east of the United States and there's churches all over the place and I grew up in a mainline Protestant denomination where probably every church that I've attended before I moved to Costa Rica had probably been there for a hundred years or more so church planting wasn't something that was ever really a part of the conversation that we had you guys planted a church four years ago, yeah. four years ago. I was there Ashley was there. It was so good. Oh, first that Sunday. first Sunday. So, do you do you? What, then what happens? I'm trying to ask a question without really asking the question is the problem. But um, why don't you just ask? A well, because I don't want to say what's next because that implies my expectation is that there's some thing that's next, and what's next might be. Well, we can speak to what that that conversation because we've had. That, that hits the nail on the head of, of where we're at with our leadership at the moment of trying to figure out what's next. So when we first came into church planning, and Nate, you can correct me uh, when I'm wrong, um, is that we well, we wanted to plant, this is the whole concept of planting pregnant. You know, we, we plant a church that's going to plant a church. And last time we did plant pregnant, but that's, that's a whole different thing. Are thing. you saying plant pregnant? Yes. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Ready to give birth? Got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is got it, got it. One. Never um, two babies. heard We took that far too literally in our first church plant. But yeah, that's what he meant by that. That's yeah. an interesting church growth model, by the way. It is. It was <laughs> very effective. Yeah. Our children's ministry went up like, like 10, <laughs> 10 kids. It just. So when we when we started the church, that's kind of our idea is that we wanted to do the next church plant. But at the same time, we also just decided that we wanted a model of leadership that was eldership based. And that we did not want to make ourselves the leaders. We wanted an eldership that was actually took ownership of the leadership of the church, which means you can't then force them to take that next step of church planting because that's our decision, not a group decision. And so we've been working on developing the leadership of the church, the elders. Um, and so then the next step for us is having the conversation, what does church growth look like for us? Do we want to go down the one road of getting bigger or go down another road of sort of siphoning off in church planning or some mix of the both or, or do none of the above or whatever? So we wanted to have that conversation as a leadership and an eldership of the church. And that's currently what we're in the process of doing is figuring out. We started setting money aside from the very beginning as a 5% of our budget each year goes towards reproducing, but that doesn't mean that we're going to plant another church mm -hmm. because we don't want to make that decision ourselves. Um, and so we wanted to let the leadership own that decision, what that looks like. So, and we are you watch the space unanimous based group. So yes, uh, it, it can't just be us trying to convince. You know, they need to be on board, and that's what we wanted. And we like uh, like you mentioned, like we started with before we even had a church, we had elders that we mm. borrowed from Shore Community Church, which was a, a great thing that they did for us. Like we could start with a couple of families from that church, a whole eldership, and those two elders have since gone back, and now we have our own group, and it's really, yeah. it's really a great model. I've thought about that since we interviewed you the first time and you told us that story. I think that's just one of the most incredible examples of generosity Oh, or yeah. heard of within a church. Yeah. Just loaning another church your elders to get the church started. Can you imagine a scenario where you all then in turn at some point have an eldership that you're loaning to another church? I would love to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's it's a beautiful thing because we've seen the benefit of it. Mm -hmm. And it's there's once you get past the fear of if I loan you these people, am I gonna lose them forever? And it starts with a sense of competitiveness and just moving into a space of just just go and, and do. And one of them wasn't an elder on their eldership board. The other one was and ended up being a chairman of the elders on that board. And he's the one who stayed the longest. But just there was just an attitude of, yeah, go for it. Like, let's do this. 
but also an understanding that yeah we we're going to build our own people so that they can go back so it it was generous and also it motivated us to keep moving we didn't oh we've got our elders we're fine because yeah. they were very good and we were replacing very experienced elders with people who have never been elders before so that was scary because we're like oh especially when the last one left you know because he's chairman of the elders at shore and he was just so smart really good with financial stuff with the with the logistics and the practical thinking around that sort of stuff and we're like what if we need him you know what so it's a step of fear on our side as well but it was a loan you know it's uh, they so we we sent him back so that he didn't burn out trying to do two two elderships but he gave us the foundation both of them gave us that foundation to build an eldership we had the new elders on board with them so it wasn't just like a you know pass each other through the door sort of thing so that they could pass on, you know, the culture of the eldership and all of that sort of stuff. Mm. It was it was perfect situation for us. We're very thankful to Shore for that. And for any future church planters that are listening, or or people who are wanting to someday be involved in church leadership, if you're starting a church on the other side of the planet, and you're gonna, one of the biggest pitfalls of doing that is that you have leadership on the other side of the planet mm -hmm. and trying to help you do that. And this is something we had to learn the hard way in our first church plant is that there's so much potential for misunderstanding or or manipulation in that situation. So that's why we're like, we're not doing it again that way. We're all, we're going to wait until we have an eldership. We're going to always plant churches with local leadership so that the people here that know what's happening, who know the people involved can make the decisions. So I feel like that's- And they're sitting across from us in the meetings. So when we say, yeah, we're fine, they're like, mm -hmm. you <laughs> I can see it are in you your really? eyes. Whereas the leadership in the States, and I love them and they wanted so much to help, but it was so easy just to lay their fears aside and say, we're fine. You know, or some form of that. Even when if we're, we're trying to be genuine and honest, but it's so easy to spin the way that we think, the way that we feel. And so to have someone in the room with you, it's like, you know what? You're not fine. And... I can see what's going on. So let's let's talk about this. And let's help you. That's so biblical too. I was thinking about third John because at the end he says, there's so much more I want to hear from you. There's so much more I want to say to you, but I'm just going to put away my pen and ink for right now because I want to wait to have a face-to-face -face conversation because that's where we get to the heart of the matter. And I want to be able to embrace you in my arms and say, how is it with your soul? How are you doing? And to have that alongside with you the whole way is just John would have a, liked you oh i like I, he's the beloved disciple yeah. i mean even though it's like a humble I think brag he would be like you get but, it you get it <laughs> like it's, it's, a humble brag, it's a humble brag <laughs> but it's a uh, <laughs> but you have to think too that he just he knew his identity was in the one who called himself love god is love and my identity is in that person Oh. What do you think John would say to me, Hamish? <laughs> I think he'd say you're too aloof. <laughs> That's a reference to another inside joke. I was like, <laughs> has there been a? Mo I'm going to ask this question, just assuming that there is one. Can can you share a moment with us in the last four years where it's just been something like just really surprisingly incredible that's happened that the two of you have just been like, oh, gosh, did you see what they just did? Like without us having to, oh, I can think about yeah. like I'm raising a, a you know a small human being right now, and there have been some moments in the first nine years of her life that Yolanda and I are just like, oh my gosh, like she hears us. Doesn't happen <laughs> often, but every once in a while we're like, okay, she there's stuff that we're getting through to her. Has there been something really exciting that's happened to the church that that you guys have just felt like? I there's been a lot of little moments for me. The amount of times that well we've we've tried to make a one of the big things we talked about is creating a community that is welcoming that is you know people love each other because that's the foundation for everything else so they can build and grow when they feel like they belong like the guy yesterday that told ashley that she should go sit on the other side yeah. of the sanctuary yeah 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 that person <laughs> We kicked him out. That's not acceptable. Hold up. <laughs> I have to say that that if you're wanting a welcoming church, well done, friends, because yesterday was the most warm, hospitable group of people 
complete from Helen in the kitchen oh my gosh, Helen is to amazing. Gordon praying yeah. over us to the sweet man whose name I can't remember, but Chris absolutely would, uh, welcoming us and teaching us about rugby and Nick being there and saying, hey, I think I remember you guys. Yeah. And Teresa, so, who asked me my wife and daughter's name so that she could specifically pray for them in Costa Rica because she's been praying for Central America but hasn't had someone specific to that, pray yeah. for. And so now she will be praying for my wife. That's brilliant. So she will pray. Good job, guys. Yeah, well, she prayed for me in person, yeah. and now we'll continue to pray for them, which is amazing. So that, that these are the things. The feedback we get from people, the feedback we get from new people, um, who's like, oh, yeah, I just felt like so... So there's... I'm trying to think of the best... Like general. I'll give you general stories, mm -hmm. and then one specific story. So... Um, there have been several times that I have after you, the end of the service, you know, like I've done my preaching, that is my least people time, by the way, like, you know, sometimes you're like, I really want to talk to someone. And sometimes like, it's my job to go talk to someone. That's the moment I feel after church It's my job. I'm going to do it. So I stand up and I look around and I have no one to talk to because everyone is talking to someone else. You know, I'm like, oh, I think I saw when I was preaching, I saw some new people. I like, there they are in conversation with another family, not a, not a staff family, not an elder family, just the family, mm -hmm. you know? And, and you look around, I'm like, I, you see people praying for yeah, people are praying, people are talking, they're laughing, they're, they're having morning tea together. They see someone is like, and that will hear, oh, I was looking for someone new this morning. So they went and talked to someone new and it's like. My job here is that I, like, yeah. I didn't have to go and do anything. And so then I could have a deeper conversation with someone because that's something I can do, you know. So that's that's a general story. The this more specific one, if I can, I know Nate's eager to jump in here as well. But um, we had, there was a church down the road that went through a little bit of a leadership spat. And, and there was all of these people who were previously part of leadership, but there was a new direction and they felt pushed out. Some of them were actually pushed out. And they were hurt. There was a whole group of them that were just burned. And one of the, some of them who were determined to stay in church came along, they visited us, and they immediately felt like they belonged, like they were welcome, like this is a, okay, this is okay. So they brought everyone. And so we went from like 40, 50 people to like 80 people, yeah. <laughs> sort of like in one Sunday, like, what is going on here? <laughs> um, but none of them were able to invest in the community. They were they were burnt. And so we, we recognized that. We're like, okay, just be, just heal, just take time, all of that sort of stuff. And um, they did. They just sat there. They, they just were healed. We tried to welcome them as much as possible. People were doing that outside of us. And now they're fully invested and they're in leadership and they love people and, and you know Helen you know their family was one of those families and you can just see that they're like we felt the healed here yeah. this is a church that like that it lifted them back up and pushed them back on their trail you know I had a chat with one lady who was because we were talking about deconstructing and she was like yeah I was, I was pretty much done I mean she was done with church you know, um, but she was invited along by one of these other families from that church. Mm -hmm. Just come along, give it a try. She hasn't left since and is invested and engaged. Like that's, that's a win, right? Like that, mm -hmm. that's so exciting for me. And we didn't do diddly squat. <laughs> yeah, we can't take credit. We didn't. And it's, it's just like, God's given us such good people. Good people. And it's, but that's, and they've taken on that vision. They've taken on that ethos. And because it, they received it, they're now giving it. And oh, it's just beautiful, you know? So that's that's my big exciting thing. I, I will say, I don't want to be too self-deprecating in that situation because we, we were intentional about what we were saying to people. We want this church to be a loving church. We want mm -hmm. you to help each other take steps towards Jesus. Yeah. And we tried to model that as well. But, but really, God... We just plant the seeds. God does the work, right? He's He's the one that makes people. He partners with us and uses us, but yeah, it's definitely His work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I those moments for me have been really. I've been impressed by God's goodness, His faithfulness mm -hmm. throughout, like from the beginning, from meeting you and being like, "Whoa, we're we're able to now ch plant a church." 
God providing from other sources so quickly to start mm. this church. Um, and then just seeing like moments where the moment that he mentioned, people came along from this other church. And, and on that, just a quick side note, I've, I kind of felt, I was like, well, sometimes there's this little voice in my head, like, well, we're not planting churches to get people from other churches to come to our church. Yes. And then, and I feel like conflicted at times when that happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But then I remember this, this story about the lost sheep mm. and Jesus is he's his ministry primarily was to the Jews, God's people. And so he, he's telling that story in his context. His context is the flock is a church, right? And someone has, has left the church and so they were with us and then they, maybe they got burned. They got hurt from big C church. Right. And Jesus is like, I'm going after that person. We're bringing them back in. I always thought that was like, I always thought of that story as like evangelism in the pure sense of like converting someone. But in Jesus context, he was getting a church person to come back to church. And so I'm like, okay, God, like if this is our ministry more than, the pure sense of evangelism and converting everyone who's an atheist to become Christian. Um, I'm, I'm okay to do that. Cause that's what you're putting me here to do. Yeah. We're not going to stop trying to do that other stuff too. No, we want, and we, we have seen some yeah. of that, but yeah, but it's, it's a, we've, we've tried to take on an ethos too. This is slightly different, but plays into that of instead of being proactive to what, you know, here's a vision, let's go and do it rather be reactive to what is God already doing? Like what sort of stuff is already happening? That was a really good example of that because that was no part of anyone's plan mm. for church growth is to pick up the pieces of another blow up. Yeah. Um, but we just tried to be reactive. It's like, okay, this is what you're doing, God. We'll do it. Yeah. And it's been beautiful. I'm thinking about the, the hospitality, the welcoming spirit. And, and also, and I may be making a connection that's just not there. And I do that a lot, but, I remember the first time we talked to Nate, the sort of the bombshell of being in that interview for a lot of people was the fact that the population of New Zealand that are Christians is so small, 4%, I think is what you said. So being part of such a small minority, to me, I mean, I almost want to make it into like a, almost like a refugee mentality where like, if, if anyone wants to be a part of that group you want to bring them in because you know what it's like to not have anybody else that shares this thing this faith you know with you like do you think it's natural for for christians here who are such a minority culturally to be welcoming to people who are looking to be a part of that community because they know what it's like out there to not be a part of the community or am i just making something like I think it would be incredibly romantic if that was the case. If it was like, you know, you've been wandering through the wilderness alone and suddenly you come across as people who also at some point wandered through that wilderness alone and know how much better it is to be in community. And so, of course, they're going to welcome you into the community because they know what it's like not to have a community. Yeah, I, I do think that loneliness is a really big factor in New Zealand. There are a lot of lonely people. Now, to say that the church is the only place where they can find mm -hmm. community would be wrong. Mm -hmm. um, I do think that we do it well. Like when, when we do it well, we do it really well because it's the love of God that's uh, mm -hmm. uh, the faithful. Um, un, what's the word? Um, his, his love is unconditional. <laughs> why, why couldn't I think of that? His unconditional love uh, in community is so much better than than more like the transactional kind of love that you find in if you do something for me mm -hmm. then you know i'll be a friend uh i think that that's all, what people sometimes find in the non-church communities and mm -hmm. they like they're part of a sports team or mm -hmm. but hopefully when they come into a church community they find people who just choose to love you not because of what you can offer not because of who you are what you've done but the way God loves us because he chooses to love us mm -hmm. and we want to model that to each other. Mm -hmm. So when, when we do find people 
coming in who haven't been into a church, that I think that they are shocked by the kind of love that they experience, and that's what you want. Especially people who haven't found a place because they don't necessarily, at least in their own minds, have something to offer. Yeah. It's not, you know, people who are marginalized or whatever. I think the other side of that coin, uh, from what you were saying, Will, is having that small percentage and, and almost like that refugee sort of thing, although I think I know enough refugees, I probably can't say that, <laughs> you know, because it's, it's not hard being a Christian in this country. So we're not quite there at that stage yet. But because we are a small group, what's happening, I think, within Christian culture in New Zealand is a blurring of the lines between different denominational groups and different church groups. Um, <clears throat> I think out of a necessity of realizing that we just don't have the critical mass to support this segmentedness in mm -hmm. Christianity. So there is more of, of blurring of lines and welcoming of each other. Mm -hmm. And so being part of, like we're part of church groups or pastors group pastors groups often um with different denominations and different churches at where i live in cumu which is just sort of semi-rural just outside of auckland is you know there's four or five churches in town and we all get together and once a month just to pray and talk through what we can do together so there's more of that sort of stuff i think happening which is a, a positive byproduct of being a smaller group of people downside is of course we have less infrastructure less resources and all of that sort of stuff but yeah I'm really hungry. <laughs> so before Ashley eats her arm, we will say goodbye. But it's been great being in a room with you guys. I ain't us with you. Thanks for coming to our place. Absolutely. To do the podcast. That's awesome. So season three, if you will all come to Costa Rica and we'll do a follow-up interview in Costa Rica. I am there. I am 100% there. <laughs> all right. We're good. All right. Bye, Ashley. Bye, Will. Bye, Nate. Let's eat. Bye, Hamish. Bye. Leaders. You've been listening to The Broken Banquet, a podcast by Will Bailey and Ashley Goad. Music provided by Irene and the Sleepers. Join us next week for another episode. He's prepared the table. All things are ready. Come to the feast. Come to the feast.